and welcome at the 17th annual Kościusz Kocure Conference. My name is Filip Styczyński and I am the Director of Operations at the Center for Intermarium Studies at the Institute of World Politics. The theme of this year's conference is Threats and Opportunities in the Intermarium, an update. Today's joint virtual symposium is organized by the Institute of World Politics. For those who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are interested in learning more about us, please visit us at iwp.edu. On behalf of IWP, I would like to thank all of our supporters who make IWP events possible. Today we'll be hearing from Professor Andrzej Nowak. Professor Andrzej Nowak is a Polish Sovietologist and historian. He's the head of the sub-department of Eastern European History at the Institute of History of the Jagiellonian University and the head of the section of the history of Eastern Europe and the 19th and 20th century empires in the department of 20th century history of the Polish Academy of Sciences. He's the author of over 30 books, over 200, 200 scholarly articles and reviews, and over 400 newspaper articles, winner of numerous prizes and awards, including Knight of the Order of the White Eagle. Welcome, Professor Andrzej Nowak. Thanks uh, to the uh, Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. Uh, my book about uh, forgotten appeasement from 1920, uh, the one offered by uh, British statesmen, especially uh, Prime Minister David Lloyd George to Lenin at the coast of all Eastern Europe and Poland uh, especially, uh, has been translated and published by a prestigious um, Anglo-Saxon, so to speak, um, uh, house uh, that is um, uh, uh, that is just two years ago, and it is now translated also and published by another pu uh, prestigious uh, publishing house in Germany, the Gruyter. So um, I have a possibility to uh, remark this occasion in order to uh, introduce my short lecture about connections between this particular example of appeasement from 1920 uh, and contemporary, uh, so to speak, temptations uh, on the part of uh, you know, Western, also American, uh, public and political opinion versus uh, Putin's aggression uh, against Ukraine and, to put it more generally, against Europe. Uh, that is so visible, I mean, that aggression in the past two years. Uh, however, it lasts not just last two years, but many, many more decades or even centuries. Uh, so at the focus of our interest is the very concept of appeasement. It is uh, always connected, if it is connected at all, with 1938 and Munich conference, the moment when Western, uh, Western European powers uh, based on uh, democracy, parliamentary democracy, uh, principles of uh, liberalism, uh, decided to uh, authorize, so to speak, uh, aggressive uh, demands uh, made by Adolf Hitler versus Czechoslovak state. Munich conference from uh, the end of September 1938 became uh, afterwards a symbol of the uh, fatal consequences of appeasement policy because uh, uh, the wisdom of appeasement as presented by British uh, uh, and French prime ministers when they uh, flew back home from Munich to Paris and to London was that uh, to give way for some uh, more or less rationalized demands of uh, Adolf Hitler, would uh, form a permanent basis for peace, P 
peace that is so needed and so demanded by societies they ruled, uh, that is French and British respectively. But uh, to make things short, we can quote this uh, famous saying that they wanted, saying by uh, Winston Churchill, who criticized very openly this politics of appeasement towards Hitler, they wanted to uh, have peace and uh, they uh, consecrated their honor for uh, that goal. Uh, I am uh, reminding you that France had uh, a valid strategic military agreement with Czechoslovakia, giving guarantees to Czechoslovakia to help this country in case of being attacked by Germany. And France simply totally disregarded uh, this particular uh, honorable and uh, I would say legal um, legal element of uh, of French uh, duty towards its Eastern European or Central European, if you will, ally. So uh, Western powers consecrated the, uh, their honor to get peace. As a result, uh, commented Churchill, they lost honor and they got war. Because as everybody knows, uh, several months later, uh, Hitler made just one more step towards aggression, uh, liquidating the remnants of Czechoslovak state, and then attacked Poland, initiating uh, the World War II in collusion with Joseph Stalin, with whom he signed. Uh, before uh, the war broke out, uh, so-called Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. These are things that everyone knows, everybody remembers, at least everybody who knows anything about 20th century history. However, as I tried to dig out from archives, from uh, not uh, published historical materials from 1920, there uh, had been a, a very interesting example of that same policy of appeasement uh, uh, on the part of uh, Western statesmen vis-a-vis uh, -vis another aggressor, this time uh, Soviet uh, Russian aggressor, that is Lenin and Stalin, in 1920. Uh, this was the moment when Lenin uh, uh, mobilized his armies to go west through Poland to realize the, uh, the dream of reaching Berlin and uh, revolutionizing the whole continent. Uh, in that prospect, uh, Lloyd George decided to continue his previously based uh, and previously initiated politics of initiating talks with Soviets uh, uh, which were founded on his, that is Lloyd George, and uh, liberal, not just liberal, also conservative uh, uh, circles uh, uh, of uh, British establishment opinion, that uh, even these barbarians, as they thought about the Bolsheviks, uh, even these barbarians could be satisfied by giving them meat giving them lesser sheep from Eastern Europe to, uh, so to speak, feed their uh, uh, appetite. Uh, so uh, giving them consent, Western European consent, to take first Ukraine, then maybe Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, but then also a much bigger uh, chunk uh, of meat, or I would say of geopolitically uh, vital uh, territory uh, between Russia and Germany, that is Poland, reborn after 123 years of partitions between Russian and German powers, that this particular deal could stop Soviets from uh, Russian Soviets from further aggression and could guarantee peace and stability uh, in the world at large, so to speak, the real world, the real civilization, uh, beginning with Germany and all to the west of Germany. Uh, the zone between Germany and Russia was treated simply as a vague zone which could be concentrate, uh, sorry, consecrated to the appetites of uh, brutal, 
but very effective power of Russian Empire. It was all based not on any sympathy towards communism. Uh, Lloyd George was a liberal. He uh, had uh, communist ideals in full contempt. But it was based on a, a deeply ingrained vision of world politics as based on uh, agreement between uh, most powerful empires, British, French, German, American, uh, and Russian. Yes, this empire that dominated Eastern Europe and Northern Eurasia uh, throughout uh, the past at least two centuries, beginning at least from Peter I, from the end of 17th century. So uh, in that, I would say, geostrategic imagination of uh, so-called realist in early 20th century, even after the war, it was uh, somehow natural to think that the only stable uh, peace to be attained is a peace which could satisfy all members of this concert of empires. That's why uh, Lloyd George uh, pursued uh, in the Versailles Conference policy of diminishing, uh, I would say, uh, negative consequences of the lost war for Germany. He wanted to make Germany not revisionist country, but a country that would accept the Versailles Treaty. And along with the same logic of so-called imperial realism, he wanted to satisfy Russia. Even though it was now a different Russia, communist Russia, it did not change even uh, a bit his opinion that Moscow, be it uh, red or white, any Moscow should be satisfied. And if for the satisfaction Moscow needs to have Poland, Ukraine or other countries in the region, let her. Uh, so that's how he initiated these talks that were continued even in July and mid-August 1920. I would like to remind that on August 10th, when Red Army was at the gates of Warsaw, some uh, 14 kilometers from the center of Warsaw, that is less than 10 miles from the heart of Warsaw, capital of Poland, Lloyd George invited a special guest to uh, London, and not just to London, but to Westminster, to uh, British Parliament, uh, to, uh, to present Soviet, uh, Russian Soviet conditions of peace with the West. And on this August 10, uh, no uh, lesser a person, so to speak, no less a dignitary of uh, the Soviet Russian regime as uh, a person number two in the hierarchy of the Bolshevik party at that moment, which uh, who was at that time uh, Lev Kamenev, deputy, first deputy of Lenin in the Soviet government uh, and the head of party organization in Moscow was invited to sit along with Lloyd George in British parliament exactly at the moment when uh, Soviet armies were storming uh, the Polish capital. And the only thing for which uh, Lloyd George waited uh, at that time was a consent of Lenin for this deal, a uh, deal based on the condition that Red Army would stop on the western border of Poland on the border of Germany, to put it uh, in other terms, that uh, Soviet army and Soviet regime, Soviet Russian imperialism would be satisfied in taking only a chunk of Europe, East Central Europe, and not Germany, not any further. But fortunately, fortunately for us, I would say, Lenin uh, was consumed but what he declared afterwards with an appropriate term, vertigo from success. At that particular moment, he believed that the Red Army could uh, would not would be able not just to liquidate Poland, 
to liquidate uh, uh, Polish army resistance, but to storm the heart of Europe, to take Berlin, and also to take uh, Budapest, uh, Prague, um, Vienna, all the way down to Rome. Exactly these capitals were mentioned in an exchange of telegrams between Lenin and Stalin, who was at that time commissary in one of the fronts storming the West at that particular moment of summer 1920. So uh, this uh, history of not realized appeasement, not realized not because it was uh, somehow stopped by any Western forces opposing appeasement, but was not realized due to the ambitions of the Soviet Russian aggressor that were much greater that, uh, than appeasement could uh, have satisfied. So this particular story uh, could be probably uh, reminded now in the context of contemporary debates over Putin's danger or Putin's Russia danger to the West, to the world, as they are uh, analyzed among Western public opinion and among Western, so to speak, um, specialists, uh, pundits, that try to find way from this uh, nightmare of uh, the war in Europe. Uh, and most frequently now, uh, an element that is invoked uh, in these discussions is uh, a scenario in which Putin is presented by the mainstream parties and media in Western European countries and in the States. Putin is presented as a potential leader of far right, extreme right, that endangers stability of Western societies, a patron of Marine Le Pen, a patron of uh, Alternative für Deutschland in Germany, patron of, uh, uh, which is so absurd that uh, I have really troubles in presenting this absurd version, patron of a Polish Law and Justice Party that made as a ruling party in the past eight years more than any party in the world to stop Putin, to alarm the West from uh, giving way to Putin. Yet uh, it is also presented by Western uh, mainstream media and mainstream politicians as a kind of fifth column of Putin. So Putin is presented simply as an object of belief, of dangerous belief, and of course, false belief in regeneration of Christian values, conservatism, tradition. Uh, this is used exactly to blackmail uh, these uh, right of center parties in Europe to say that they should never uh, gain any, uh, so to speak, part of responsibility for ruling any country in, uh, in the West, because they are simply pawns or marionettes in the hands of Putin's imperialism. And there is a grain of truth in that uh, particular vision. Putin, uh, uh, I would say, and his uh, all uh, state uh, and KGB apparatus he uses so effectively, even though it is not called now KGB, but FSB, SVR, and many other acronyms are used in the old place of uh, KGB and GRU, but the institution is still the same. So he uh, actually uses some of uh, resources he has at his disposal to lure uh, parts of uh, really extreme right um, uh, circles uh, in Western Europe. It is rather completely ineffective in Poland, uh, but it is more effective among some uh, really uh, hard right and alt-right, so to speak, elements uh, in Western Europe and in the United States to create this picture that uh, Russia is the stronghold, the La Citadel of Christian traditional values, and Putin is the last defender of these values against 
uh, political correctness, woke culture, LGBT rights, and so on and so forth. This particular vision, uh, however, it seems to me, is not that popular, even among uh, uh, right-wing uh, sympathizers, extreme right-wing sympathizers in the West, yet it exists. What is much more effectively used by Putin and gives him many more chances to uh, reach appeasement with uh, the Western countries is not any kind of, I would say, uh, right-wing counter-revolution that would sign a, a new deal with Russia. No, much more effective is already now uh, another narrative that Putin uh, puts into motion, so to speak, uh, on many channels uh, uh, that is especially aimed to so-called realists such as John Mearsheimer in the States, previously, now late, uh, Henry Kissinger. But this kind of realist exists in any of uh, these uh, Western former powers or still existing superpowers, be it uh, United States, uh, France or uh, Germany. Simply, they are persuaded to believe that there is possible a deal just like Lloyd George believed, that simply Russia needs her zone of influence, just as America, United States, needs its own imperial zone of influence in Western Hemisphere. So for Russia, this zone of influence, of course, covers Ukraine, but also uh, a former external uh, zone of Soviet empire that is uh, so-called people's democracies from uh, Poland uh, through uh, former Czechoslovakia to uh, through Hungary to Romania and Bulgaria, that this should be more or less given to uh, Russia's influence, uh, be it fully like with Ukraine, maybe now half of Ukraine to give back to Russia then uh, maybe all Ukraine. Now uh, there is no talk about any territorial uh, changes as regards territory of Poland or other uh, East Central European countries, but at least they should be rejected the right to belong to the military pact they wanted, that is to NATO. This is exactly the narrative of Putin, which is well, I would say more or less effective in reaching minds of those realists uh, whom I mentioned, and, and of course, uh, much larger circles they influence. So there is belief that Putin could be satisfied by being treated, Russia's uh, uh, imperial ambitions could be satisfied by being given their share in imperial divide of the world. Is Central Europe simply would satisfy Putin. But generally speaking, those realists uh, usually do not know anything, absolutely anything about Russia, about Russian history, Russian culture, Russian traditions, Russian political culture. So they simply do not know, or, or at least do not consider seriously, the power of other I would say, much deeper layers of this tradition, of this political culture. And one of the most uh, important and deepest layers of this tradition is anti-Westernism, uh, something that forms the very uh, identity of Russian imperial tradition, Russia opposing the West, Eastern Orthodox Russia, then Communist Russia, any Russia looking at the West as not just source of uh, uh, models, of innovations, but essentially all these innovations, all these uh, things that are taken from the West by Russia are uh, finally used to destroy the West, to make Russia the victor over Western enemy. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, the, the most important opponent to Russia was uh, the United Kingdom, British Empire. 
from uh, Yalta conference, the last, uh, I would say, uh, symbol of appeasement policy giving East Central Europe to Stalin's uh, superpower. After Yalta, of course, the United States became the epitome of the West that must, must be destroyed, uh, finally, from the Moscow perspective. And it had not changed even for a second from those years, that is from 1945. Russia, after 1991, only wanted a breathing space to gain, again, power and uh, room of maneuver to enfeeble, divide internally the West and finally beat the West with other partners. So mentioning these two narratives, one in which Putin presents himself as a savior of Western traditions and Christianity and gathers, so to speak, his, his fifth column among uh, far-right uh, element circles in, in the West, and the other one much more powerful in the mainstream and much more influential, much more hopeful for Putin, this narrative uh, addressed to realists also in the States. There are, however, three other narratives that were, uh, and it is important, uh, already presented in 1920. That's why I suggest uh, anyone uh, interested in deeper analysis of contemporary dangers to look at the book which I mentioned in the beginning, my book about the original appeasement from 1920. These three other narratives that are now uh, presented and uh, emitted, so to speak, to um, uh, different uh, circles in the world should be read now along with this two first, which I mentioned. And what makes Western observers sometimes uh, really helpless uh, in, uh, in front of this Putin's propaganda is the fact that they select only the narrative which is addressed to them, and they either don't see, don't hear, don't listen to four other narratives that are emitted at the same time parallelly by Putin. And these three other uh, narratives, which I will mention very briefly now, are as follows. The first one was uh, presented by Lenin, already in 1916, when he wrote his probably one of the most incisive and most interesting text, that is uh, uh, imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism. The essence of this long essay was to present hopes for Russia to become leader, not just of class social revolution, but also to lead a kind of revolt uh, which could be called the West and the rest, or rather the rest against the West. And Russia leads the rest, uh, that is territories of Africa, Asia, Latin America, against imperial powers, colonial powers of Western Europe and the United States. This is exactly a, a kind of geopolitical revolution introduced into the Marxist doctrine by Lenin in his essay. And he was not the only one to find this possibility of, uh, uh, of defeating the West uh, uh, during uh, that period which I describe in my book. Already in 1919, when efforts of the Red Army to storm instantly Central Europe uh, militarily were stopped by the civil war in Russia, and by the counter efforts of Poland, especially mobilizing its military forces to stop the Red Army march into the center of Europe. Leo Trotsky, who was at that time uh, a kind of political supervisor of the Red Army, sent a telegram to Lenin saying that at this particular moment, when we cannot reach the heart of Europe with military means, we can reach Europe, we can reach the West via Africa, via Asia, via Vietnam, via Algiers, via all these colonies 
that are exploited uh, uh, and uh, oppressed, downtrodden by Western colonialism and could organize a kind of global revolt against the West, against Paris, London, Washington. And this was finally, and probably in a most uh, rhetorically effective and then practically effective way by Stalin uh, in the end of 1920, after the debacle of yet another storm of Red Army to Europe, I mean the debacle on the Vistula River, where Polish army defeated decisively Red Army, trying to get through Poland to Berlin, to the heart of Europe. Stalin uh, rethought uh, the strategy of uh, Soviet Russia and stated uh, in one of his uh, very important speeches in Baku, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, uh, at that time conquered by Soviet Russia, that Russia should lead the revolt of global south of uh, the oppressed nations of Asia and Africa against uh, colonialists from uh, the West. I will not quote fully his uh, speech, which is really extremely uh, powerful in its rhetoric and extremely incisive in developing this uh, scheme, which is now realized by Putin. I want only to stress how effectively it is realized now. It is uh, enough to look at Central Africa, countries of Sahel, which were now completely conquered, one, one can say, by former Wagner Group sent there by Putin. Now uh, this Wagner Group renamed itself into Africa Corps, Afrikanski Corpus of, uh, uh, of uh, Russian Federation that takes control on, of the former, uh, I would say, colonial empire of France. Um, but Putin is, and Putin's Russia is, uh, globally popular, popular, I would say, in uh, especially so-called Global South, exactly as the power that defies Washington DC, that defies, uh, because the, the main enemy, of course, from that perspective is Washington, America as the symbol of colonialism, of exploitation of uh, poor countries uh, of, uh, of Global South, Africa, Latin America, Asia. So this kind of rhetoric and methods used uh, by Putin's Russia to mobilize opinion uh, beyond Europe and beyond the United States to simply liquidate Americans' position, uh, United States' position in the world, are uh, a constant uh, element of and very important element of Putin's politics. His aim is not to make deal with America. His aim is to destroy the United States. However, he uh, has other possibilities to develop uh, that uh, strategy. So the, the fourth narrative, which I mentioned uh, now, uh, is also or has been uh, developed uh, since times of 1920. Uh, it was based, this fourth narrative, on a strategy of di dividing the West itself on the line of conflicts between former empires. Now it means conflict between Germany and France, on one hand, or Western Europe, against the United States. In 1919-1920, Lenin coined that strategy, believing that Germany, beaten in World War I, would never accept Western powers, American or Anglo-Saxon, British American uh, rule, British uh, American domination. So Germany would be ready to, uh, uh, to help Soviet Russia in destroying the Versailles Treaty, in ejecting Americans from Europe. Of course, after World War II, uh, this uh, element would be even strengthened, a kind of resentment of Germans uh, but also of uh, the French, of being uh, saved by uh, Americans twice. Uh, this resentment, anti-American resentment, became uh, uh, very much exploited by the Soviets and now by Putin. In order to show you just one example how it works, I want to re revoke 
uh, a series of interviews uh, Putin gave on the occasion of 60th anniversary of the victory of the Soviet Union in World War II. It was very simple. It was as follows. For uh, American television, uh, Putin said the only way to save uh, the world uh, for peace, for stability, is to re-establish uh, uh, conditions of two superpowers collaboration, uh, meaning, of course, Russia uh, as a partner, superpower partner to, uh, to Washington, D.C. This is something that realists in Washington and other uh, places of, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, pseudo wisdom still believe uh, in the United States. But at this same day, Putin gave completely different interviews to the French and to uh, German televisions. To the French, he said the only way to uh, make peace stable is to fight fascism, which we fought bravely. Uh, French uh, resistance and uh, Soviet army, Russian Soviet army uh, in World War II, and to base this uh, anti-fascist collaboration on uh, a strong uh, partnership between a traditional imperial guardians of order. Uh, Russia and France are from times of Peter I and Catherine II, natural partners, Russia followed the model of French culture, and so they can save not just peace and stability by collaborating uh, to organize this order in Europe, but also to save European culture from more primitive influences. Meaning, of course, Yankees in Europe get out of Europe, these primitive Yankees, and we will save civilization and peace without them. This was the essence of this uh, proclamation of Putin to the French public opinion. Repeated, of course, many times afterwards. But the most interesting was his interview given to two German televisions. He stated that the best times for Europe were times when there was all along common boundary between Germany and Russia. Only strictest collaboration uh, between Germany and Russia could restore golden age for Europe, when nothing would divide, no country would divide uh, Germany and Russia. No country meaning no Poland, no Baltic countries, uh, simply common border like uh, it was maybe not during Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact deal, but during times of Chancellor Bismarck and Chancellor Gorchakov. And this is something which Putin evokes constantly to German, uh, not just politicians, but more importantly, to German uh, businessmen, uh, suggesting that only with uh, the uh, expansion of uh, economic uh, uh, relations with Russia, Germany could thrive. And uh, so the only condition to reach such a stable agreement is to eliminate American influences from Europe, simply eliminate America from the world stage. So the last of these narratives of appeasement, which I present here, uh, and all of them should be taken parallelly as a kind of strategy of destroying the West. So the last of these narratives is addressed to the left and to the extreme left, but also to so-called left liberal mainstream parties in which Russia presents itself, Putin's Russia, as a potential, at least partner, in taming neo-fascist forces stemming from Eastern Europe stemming, of course, from unruly countries, just like Poland, uh, Ukraine. Uh, these countries just, that form a kind of a burden to, uh, to Western uh, societies and are treated, uh, are never treated as equal partners uh, in that uh, Western liberal mainstream opinion. That's why they are always uh, somehow um, potentially accused of being non-Western, non-liberal, uh, potentially fascist. So Russia, even if it is 
maybe not completely politically correct in itself, uh, being uh, power in itself could tame this dangerous uh, tendencies uh, uh, as a as a partner for Western uh, powers. And there is one example how it worked in times of uh, Putin's predecessor. It was French Prime Minister Edouard Balladur in uh, mid 90s who proposed to Russia to become uh, something like a guardian of uh, human rights in Eastern Europe. France would control as a, as a uh, kind of natural heir of the French Revolution, uh, human rights in Western Europe and Russia would control, would take responsibility for the Eastern or East Central Europe where uh, elements of fascism are always present. So this kind of tradition of narrative is yet again uh, uh, an element of uh, Russia's strategy not to appease the world, not to appease, not to take any offer of real appeasement from the West, but to destroy the West and to realize final goals of Russian imperialism, which is to have all Europe and to destroy American presence in this hemisphere. Thank you very much.